Billy, Billy was around at the time too when that happened. Uh, gosh, this was back in 1983, and uh, Steve was living in Silmar. Really, and he had a he had a home studio there, and he was putting together a group, and he was auditioning musicians. And I heard about the audition, so I drove up there. It's kind of was kind of far from me. And um, long story short, um, I was like the last guy of the day. And I had my Zappa t-shirt on. And from what I found out later from Steve, but I didn't know at the time, he was so burned out and so tired of people saying they liked Frank Zappa and then couldn't play good enough. They weren't able to handle, you know, the music that he was, you know, putting out. Yeah. That by the time I came, he said, when I walked in, he said, this is after the fact now. He said, when I walked in, he looked at me like, oh, God, here we go. Listen to the Vibes. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Listen to the Vibes, and I'm very happy to uh welcome mr larry kutcher here he's uh you've been a studio musician for many years and uh, now you've come out with your your own album and uh if i'm not mistaken i read it comes out tomorrow the 31st yeah it's gonna it uh, it's gonna stream everywhere tomorrow you know on the usual suspects you know, spotify apple tunes youtube music all that uh pandora I did release it earlier. Uh, it has been out to purchase as a download on Bandcamp. Okay. Uh, so I'm at larrycutcher.bandcamp.com. So I said, so I did a pre-release of it there, and um, then a delayed uh, a release on all the uh, on the streaming services. Um, so um, yeah, I'm very excited about this tonight at midnight. I go live. <laughs> wow. You know, yeah. I've, I've noticed a lot of musicians using that band camp. What is that? It's a great platform. It's it's mainly used by musicians and fan, like hardcore fans that really love the artists they follow. In other words, they'll go buy the CDs. They'll buy vinyl. They'll buy merch. Um, they'll buy the albums directly. And what's great, it's sort of a social construct as well you can join as a fan and have your own profile and you can interact with fans from all over the world and the artists like myself who are on Bandcamp. so it's a very uh, uh personalized experience and you find that the heart your hardcore fans and followers um you'll really find them there on Bandcamp. um because you know most people these days stream everything right right um and and when i researched all this to you know to, to to launch this debut album you know what i found was that a lot of artists were doing band camp and the streaming both so i thought okay i think i'll try it because i had never heard of band camp either only mm -hmm. you know like a month before and um and there's some great artists on there um i've seen um what's his name from uh, dream theater jordan rudis Okay. Has some work on there and um, Glass Hammer, you know, the prog band. Okay. Um, and um, it's just a great platform. So that's where I initially launched it uh, on March 1st, actually, at the beginning of the month. Well, and I might have to check that out. I've, like I said, I've had a few artists on here that I've, I've noticed they have links to Bandcamp, and I was curious. Yeah, it, it yeah, I highly recommend checking it out because um you can discover a lot of new indie musicians as well. There are a lot of musicians that are, you know, launching their 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 music from that platform, you know, as sort of as sort of a launch, a launching pad, and then going on, you know, including the streaming as well. You know, so yeah, I I would definitely recommend it. Well, before we get into any further discussion, uh, tell us a little bit more about you. Okay. Yeah. Um, 
Well, I was originally born in New York, um, in Schenectady, New York. And um, both of my parents were musicians. My father was a jazz drummer. My mother was an opera singer. He was an Italian Jew and she was a, uh, I mean, excuse me, he was a German Russian Jew and my mother was an Italian Catholic. <laughs> so, boy, just think about that. <laughs> boy, you you got the, the best of all kinds of I worlds the there, didn't you? All, exactly. <laughs> And so then we moved out here to California when I was quite young, you know, um, and uh, so I basically grew up in Southern California. I'm based in in the Studio City area in the valley here in, in Los Angeles County. And um, uh, but them both being musicians, of course, um, I used to sneak into their records, you know, little kid, you know, five years old, wanting to hear Beethoven or Dizzy Gillespie, or, you know, what is all this beautiful music, you know? And uh, so then my mother encouraged me to uh, take up the violin. So I started my musical training at like six years old on the classical violin. And, um, but as I got older, I start, I, the second instrument I picked up was the guitar. I started playing the guitar at like 12 um, and taught myself. And then I also started playing the drums because uh, I love the drums. So I was in my first little band, you know, in like eighth grade and, um, you know, just uh, playing these different instruments. I even sang, I was like a lead singer in the band. I guess I got that from my mom. And it wasn't until I was very, just about graduated high school I was like 17, that I, 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 that's the first time I ever touched a piano. No kidding. I'd been around pianos all my life and it never occurred to me to even, to even play one. Um, but I remember I was in the music room at my high school and there was a piano there. And for some reason, I don't know why, I just gravitated over there. I sat down and within like 10 minutes, I'm playing a little boogie woogie, just <laughs> teaching myself. <laughs> right, you know, dun, 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 dun. you know, the music teacher comes in and he says, "What the heck's going on? <laughs> you know, <laughs> how are you doing this?" <laughs> it just was so natural. In three months, I was in a band, you know, playing keyboards, and um, so keyboards became the piano became my touchstone. That's where I compose. That's where I write, um, and I still play drums and guitar, but. Um, the piano became the thing and I was completely self-taught. Wow. Um, I did study for three months with a classical pianist just to make sure I had the right fingering and whatnot. Um, and, um, but other than that, I just continued, you know, on, on my own. Um, and um, so that's how, that's how the whole musical journey began, you know. Mm. And we found out that we both love Frank Zappa. Yes. Frank Zappa, I would I have to credit as the greatest influence on me, not only musically, but also my personality, my my bent sense of humor, my tendency to be kind of blunt. You know, I, I'm known to be, I sort of just speak my mind i try to be you know respectful of folks i'm not rude or, or but i'm i'm just very open and i got that from frank i i discovered frank at 11 years old um i heard uncle meat and it sent me into a state of mind i'd never experienced before it you know later one would call it like an altered state of consciousness uh you know coming on to some kind of a psychedelic experience or something. But I mean, it just opened my mind, this little kid. And I, it, it changed the way I thought, the way I heard music. It was really that, that profound of an, uh, uh, of an experience for me at 11 years old. It, it, it totally changed the trajectory of my whole musical uh, career and, and my way of thinking. And, and like I said, um, his sense of humor, uh, you know, just huge influence on me. So yeah, Frank, God, I, I love Frank. 
God, I miss them. I miss, you know, I miss that we don't have them. Yeah, that, that you'll never have another genius like Zappa ever again. I agree. Nobody, no. just nobody has ever been like him before or since. It's one of those rare, beautiful things, you know. I can just imagine what people are thinking when I'm walking through the store singing, why does it hurt when you <laughs> pee? <Right. laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I, I remember, I got a funny quick little story. When I was, uh, I think about 19 or 20, I had, was moving into this little new little bungalow and I was, it was like three in the morning when I was moving in, you know, musicians hours and it was the winter. So I had like, you know, I'm like six, five, you know, my hair is down my back and I had this long black coat on and next door, this guy comes out and he's sort of checking me out. His name was Albert Conchola, right? He was like a, he was like a, he had like a bottle of wine in one hand, right? Mm -hmm. and a joint in the other, and he's in his boxers. He comes down <laughs> and he says to me, hey, Holmes, what are you, FBI? Who are you, man? <laughs> he couldn't figure me out, right? And I said, no, man, I'm a musician. I'm moving in. And he goes, I don't believe you, man. Can I smoke a joint in your in your in your living room? I said, Yeah, come on in. It's cool. You know, <laughs> I don't even know the guy, right? It's three in the morning, you know. And he's a big guy, tattoos all over him, you know. And and so he comes in. And on the floor, I had the out the vinyl of Weasels Rip My Flesh, you know, from Zappa. Yep. You know, that great cover with a guy shaving with a weasel, right? Yep. Albert looks at it, takes one look. And he goes into like hysterical laughter. I mean, he and he looks at me, he goes, you're all right, man. You know, and because of that album, we became like good friends. Unlikely, you know, this white guy, you know, and this, this, and he was like in a gang. I mean, he was like kind of a hardcore guy. He no, was, no. And, and, but we, we became friends because of Frank Zappa. So, <laughs> wow. That was pretty cool, you know. Yeah. I actually have that t-shirt weasels rip my flesh yeah <laughs> yeah i have that and uh freak out and i uh, found that in new jersey and wow. i had just for some reason I, I we had made a trip to new york and i told the wife i said i, I want to check out new jersey and uh, we went to red bank and i i wanted to go see uh the Kevin Smith's comic book store over there and right across the street was an old record store and they had the freak out. Oh, shirt. Wow. And so my wife is like, Oh, you really like that guy? I'm like, yeah. And so she, uh, she bought me a shirt that just says zap on it. Got a huge picture of him on it. And then she got me a Zappa for president shirt and our bathroom has a big picture of frank sitting on the toilet so i've i've got that original <laughs> poster as well <laughs> it's a great poster. Yeah. yeah i i i laminated that thing on you know to make it last you know because i've had it since i was like 17 i think you i know. could just i can just imagine what my friends and family think when they come and see a framed picture of a guy sitting on the toilet the toilet right <laughs> <laughs> it's been interesting in my life having people that I know not understand that part of me, you know, yeah. because I, I mean, I grew up with like a strong, I don't want to say religious because I'm not religious, but like I was like a strong Christian background. Mm -hmm. I almost became a priest. <laughs> oh, wow. young. I was, you know, going to go into the seminary. And so there's that side of me that people know and they think of me as a sort of you know serious sort of you know contemplative jesuit monk or something right you know and and that is a part of my nature but this zappa side you know to this day it's still <laughs> some people just they can't handle it. they don't understand like you know how how i could even go there and uh so i know what you mean about uh you know, the reactions you get from folks that aren't familiar with him. And you're just like humming a song or singing it. And uh, I have to admit, 
and I think I got this from Zappa, there's a part of me that kind of enjoys, you know. Yeah, people going, what? What did he just yeah. say? Right. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anything good inside of you? Is there anything good inside of you? <laughs> I love just singing Zappa lyrics off the wall and people kind of, you know, yeah. it's, it's fun. It's fun. <laughs> Yeah, my my wife encourages me to to listen to Zappa. She encourages me to listen to it alone or in the car when I'm not when she's not with me. You know that kind of thing. Uh, so she hasn't quite. Uh... I, I haven't quite give her that bug yet, but I, you know, people have their favorite guitarists. But Frank will always be number one to me, and Steve I... Vai will be my you know right below Frank. Yes. And you worked and I, with Steve Vai. Yes, I did. Um, and and um, Billy, Billy was around at the time, too, when that happened. Uh, gosh, this was back in 1983. And uh, Steve was living in Silmar. Really? And he had, a, he had a home studio there. And he was putting together a group, and he was auditioning musicians. And I heard about the audition, so I drove up there. It's kind of was kind of far from me. And um, long story short, um, I was like the last guy of the day, and I had my Zappa T-shirt on. And from what I found out later from Steve, but I didn't know at the time, he was so burned out and so tired of people saying they liked Frank Zappa, and then couldn't play good enough. They weren't able to handle, you know, the music that he was, you know, putting out. Yeah. That by the time I came, he said, when I walked in, he said, this is after the fact now. He said, when I walked in, he looked at me like, oh God, here we go. <laughs> 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 and it was funny. And he was brutal with me. Yeah. I hadn't even set up yet. And he sits, he puts one of the most complex pieces of music in front of me sight unseen never even heard it play it <laughs> and there was just no way you know my sight reading is eh, you know i can do it but he it was a piece of music that was very zappa-esque so you mm -hmm. had polyrhythms and all kinds of unusual things going on sight unseen, never heard it. And I just looked at him and I said, and I think he appreciated this. I said, you knew I wasn't going to be able to do this before you even put it here, did you? Didn't you? And he was sort of taken aback, you mm -hmm. know, and, and, and he goes, well, yeah. And I go, tell you what, if you allow me, let me show you what I can do. Okay. If you just because I could have just been all defeated and left with my head between my legs or tail between my legs, right? Right. But I thought, I'm in the room with Steve Vai. You know, this is an opportunity because I loved his music. I loved his guitar playing. I know he, he just finished playing with Frank, mm. you know, and he was so young. He was like 19. And so I was determined to make an impression on Steve. And so I... And at the time, there was a couple guys in the studio there from one of the guys from White Snake oh, was there. Really? Yeah. And and if I I'm trying to remember who else was in there, there was a couple well-known rock artists in there. So I just said, let me do my thing. And I just started picking up any instrument in the room, playing it, and then doing like stream of consciousness sort of comedy improv. Mm -hmm. Right. Because one of the things that I learned to do and Frank had influenced me, you know, with comedy is I got involved with comedy and improv and theater and stuff like that. So I was very adept. My style was to just completely emote influenced by Captain Beefheart big time. So that's kind of where I was coming from. Mm -hmm. And so I just went crazy. <laughs> I just let it all rip playing xylophones, guitars, ukuleles, drums, and, and then doing this crazed narration, after about five minutes, he, he goes, stop. <laughs> he goes, everybody clear the room. <laughs> right? 
and he looks at me through the window, you know, and he goes, who the hell are you? <laughs> <laughs> <He> goes, <laughs> he goes, he goes, I got to call Frank right there. He calls Frank. <laughs> I'm sitting there. And, and he goes, Frank, I met a genius. <laughs> he goes, I met a guy that might be crazier than you. You got to hear this guy. <laughs> and I, I was honored beyond words, right? I mean, it, it, it humbled me because Frank, Frank Zappa, you know, my right. hero, you know, I was completely humbled by that and honored. And to make a long story short, we ended up doing a three hour session. Wow. Then Steve took um, sections of my rant, if you will. I did like these rants and I sang, you know, and sculpted together a piece of music. And it was called Little Pieces of Seaweed because that was part of my rant. I was talking about, I was talking about um, a, a woman who had um, a seaweed fetish, basically, <laughs> 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 to put it mildly. <laughs> so Steve, you know, sort of edited and, you know, and kind of constructed this music around it. And it ended up um being on his flexible leftovers uh album which i still get royalties for <laughs> sweet that so was real i was just so proud you know you know i got the co-writing you know thing with steve and and i performed with his group a couple times um in in, in la and the first time i performed it was at a place called uh, fm station it used to be a big rock venue and mm. by the way, Tommy Mars was on keyboards. Frank Zappa's keyboard player, Tommy Mars. No way. Stu Ham on bass. And uh, I think Chad Wackerman on drums, if you can believe it. I mean, these were wow. stellar musicians. I, I Steve goes, whatever you want to do, don't tell me. Just surprise me. So that day I went to the beach and I got actual seaweed. <laughs> <laughs> I bought a pair of like tights. I dried the seaweed off, and right before the show, I put on the black tights and wrapped my body in seaweed. Oh, no. <laughs> and came on stage. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> and completely did a complete improvisation based off the cut from the record, which I've got the recordings for. Um, and, you know, went out to the audience, you know, just did a whole thing. And uh, the second time I performed with him, um, I came out in a full clown suit. And so it was just, you know, that kind of um, theatrical comedy influenced by Zappa. Also, I was heavily influenced by, I don't know if you remember a comedy troupe called the Firesign Theater. I do remember that. Yeah, I I was heavily influenced by them as well. and uh, And so... That worked out really great. It was fun, um, fantastic musicians. It was a, it was fun to do it. And uh, right at that time, um, Steve got the gig. Right after that, Steve got the gig with David Lee Roth. Yeah, that was about eighty five. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He went off. He went off and and toured with David Lee Roth. Um, but uh, um, that was a. That was a highlight in my life. I, you know, oh, and and one one thing that was nice about Steve, him and I went to go see Alan Holsworth together, yeah. the guitarist, who is for me, you know, right up there with Zappa and John McLaughlin, people like that. Just one of the most phenomenal guitarists that ever lived, and. Um, that was great to just go with Steve, just the two of us, you know, away from his entourage and, you know, all the stardom stuff. And um, and he was completely blown away by Alan's playing. Steve, who's an amazing player, right? Yeah. He was dumbfounded by Alan's playing. Um, it, you know, it was like, I'm not worthy kind of a moment, you know? So um, yeah, that that was a wonderful experience for sure. You can still find that piece. It's called Little Pieces of Seaweed. Um, it's on the flexible leftovers. That's a piece 
that there are some people that I know, even my ex-wife, I never told her about it. <laughs> <laughs> it is so out there. Uh, I, 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 you know, that for some people that I know, I think it would frighten them. <laughs> it's just so out there. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Steve is um, one of those guys that's like one of the, on top of my list of people that I really want to interview. And yeah. I, and the first question I was going to ask him is if he ever got that spanking. <laughs> <laughs> There's a really funny story behind that too. I'm sure you know. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, what a great, and he's still, he's still putting out beautiful music, you know? Um, oh yeah, man. Yeah. He's just, wow. The, I feel the, I, really blessed that I was able to briefly work with him. Like I did, you know? See, you and Billy Sheehan are the closest that I've gotten to Steve Vai. So, ah, you but know, I've always know. wondered what it would be like to reconnect with Steve. You know, it's been so long, and and uh, I was always hoping we would one day because it's been quite a while, you know. And uh, um, I'm still hoping, you know, we have so many friends in common that it could happen, um, you know, so you know. We'll see. I mean, it would be nice. Um, um, I have tremendous respect for him. Just tremendous. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, he's definitely up there. For him to be in awe of someone else blows my mind because I'm like, other than Zappa, who's better than you? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know? I, I was honored by it. And, and and I'm older than Steve. You know, he was like a like a younger brother to me. And, and he treated me with such respect, I, you know. And it just humbled me. I was in awe, you know. And I was, and, and and of course, I was, as as a musician in my career, I was like a nobody, you know, um, compared to Steve's career. And so he was very kind and gracious to to allow me in like that, you know. Um, something I'll never forget for sure. That it's really cool that you know somebody is. You, you admire someone and you find out that they're a really nice person yeah so it, that you get a little leery of meeting your heroes is i can say there's been maybe a couple of people that i've met in my life that uh, ended up i couldn't stand them after i met them yeah but, uh, yeah. yeah i you know, I've I've been very blessed. I, I got to meet another one of my heroes when I was 20, Chick Corea, you know, the jazz pianist. Um, because I love jazz as well. And mm -hmm. and um I met him at the Roxy when they were Return to Forever was debuting with a very young Al Di Miola. And uh, Al Di Miola was on stage with sheet music, he just joined the band, you know. And and uh, Chick was so gracious, you know. He he invited me backstage, wow. met his wife and kids, and he introduced me to John McLaughlin was back there, you know. And I'm just like this 19, 20 year old, like wide eyed, you know, and so gracious, so kind. Because like you said, sometimes you meet some of your heroes, and let's face it, some musicians can be incredibly arrogant yeah. and dismissive um not really kind people you know and when you meet somebody that great and they're so kind and gracious to you it it's really it's really quite something you know yeah. well uh i can't say that i've met a musician that has been a jerk to me but uh, i met patrick stewart and oh. he was a real jackass. So, oh, now you're talking about the yeah. actor? Yeah. Wow. He yeah. Was, yeah. Yeah. So I have a hard time watching Star Trek after that. <laughs> I don't, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he ruined it for you, right? He ruined it for me, doggone. Oh, it. man. But, you know, I, I've met like some really awesome musicians and then there's those that i mean they're good enough to be in a band but let's face it they're not like you know way up there kind of musicians right but when you meet them and how just uh, i don't know they're so appreciative of, i guess of their fans and all that you become a little bit more of a fan of them absolutely yeah you know, you know who ricky rocket is absolutely so, yeah yeah 
So real quick story. Um, it just by happenstance that I got to meet him, uh, we had went to a concert and he had thrown a guitar stick out in the, in the crowd. And my first wife's friend was with us and she caught it and it had a backstage pass on it. Right. Wow, so we were going to sit out and, and wait for her. And, you know, how are you going to say, no, we're, we're, we're going to go home. It's like, no, you, you have fun. We'll hang out here. No big deal. And the, uh, the security guard was nice enough to say, you know what, y'all come on in too. So we're in there and I met, I met Ricky and, and, uh, I had told him story of why we even started going to see poison in the first place. Cause honestly, I was not a poison fan when I was in high school, right. but they used to have a, a, uh, what was it called? A like hair, hair fest or something or metal fest. I, I right. forgot the name of it, but they would come through and they have all these classic heavy metal band or hair bands from the eighties with them. Right. And my little brother had gotten tickets and he ended up getting better seats and he gave me his. And so I'm like, Hey, sure. I'll, I'll go, you know, free concert. And they were just awesome. I, I didn't realize they could play that well and they sounded great in concert. Well, that later on that year, my little brother had uh, ended his own life and we oh. kind of made it a tradition that we were going to go each year just to kind of honor my little brother right and so i told ricky that story and he just comes over and he grabs me and he's hugging me and he goes man that's just a freaking awesome story and you know just so wow. so nice and I, i'm like okay i kind of like poison now. <laughs> yeah, yeah no that's you know it's um and not to um you know, you 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 tell me if 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 you don't want to go there, but you know I lost a younger brother as well. Really? Yeah, to drug overdose. He was only twenty. Mm. Oh man! I, I I feel your your pain. You know, uh, losing a brother is. You yeah. know, I just wanted, I just wanted to empathize with you there about that. You know. Um, um, yeah, I get you, man. My my brother uh, hung himself, and he was twenty two. So. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's, um, it, it, there's a, it leaves a hole that, that doesn't quite ever get filled, you know, that, um, you know, uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm so sorry for your loss. Well, that was 23 years ago, man. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. It's been at least that long for me too, with my brother. Yeah. Wow. Quite a while. Yeah. My well, younger- it's- it's kind of crazy when you just meet someone and you find you have so much in common. In common, yeah. That that's why I wanted to share that with you because I thought, wow, you know, that doesn't happen very often, especially something like this. My God, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, that's part of the reason why I like doing this show is I I bring people on who can inspire and you bring some positivity to other people's lives. Because, I mean, how many of us get discouraged or we don't have the, the, uh, the, the, uh, I don't know, they, we just don't want to pursue. We were too scared. We're not brave enough to try to pursue our dreams. And, right. you know, I've, I've had so many things happen to me through my life and overcame alcoholism and, and drug addiction and, you know, I've got other health scares that I'm going through now and I just don't want to give up. And I'm, I'm hoping maybe my stories will touch someone or if I bring someone like you on or any of my other guests, maybe somebody can click and that way they'll, they can say, okay, I'll pursue my dreams. Or maybe they'll say, I, maybe I can go another day. You know, you know it's, this is another amazing point of, of, of both of us going through similar things. Matter of fact, this whole album came out. Um, finally, I originally was intending to do this nine years ago, mm-hmm. and um, I, matter of fact, Billy was going to be my publicist. Billy James. Billy James. Yeah. 
And he facilitated uh, John Anderson of Yes fame. Another one of my, I love Yes. Oh, me too. Uh, and he sent, he told John about my music. He sent John a few of my pieces. And he said, now don't get your hopes up, Larry. He hears a lot of people's music and, but um, I'm, let, let's give it a shot, you know. And literally within 36 hours, he goes, Larry, miracles happen. And he sends me back my music. And John, in one of the sections of, of the music, wrote lyrics and, 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 and a vocal line. And I've got my music and I'm listening to John Anderson singing to my music. <laughs> oh, no way. Oh, my God. I got to tell you, this was back in 2000, gosh, 12 or 13. Um, and the idea was to, we were going to work it out with Jeff, I mean, with, with John, that that piece would be featured on my debut CD. And, no uh, way. what a wonderful thing to have. Well, here's a debut CD and guess what? I'm a collaboration with John Anderson of, yes, of course, you know, you'd be, I was just, uh, it was like a dream come true. And he did so beautifully, you know. And then soon after that, I went into a, like a nine year spiral, downward spiral, one health crisis after another. You're talking about facing some currently some health issues. Mm -hmm. um, I won't go into all the details, but I ended up having surgeries. I almost died twice. Um, I couldn't even play. I couldn't pick up an instrument or play for years at a time. I couldn't even play the piano or anything. Um, and there were times that I felt like I couldn't go on and didn't want to go on. You know, like you were saying, you know, when you obviously you you shared that you've experienced drug addiction and alcoholism. And so, you know, can imagine, you know, the challenge is that, you know, and to face that and to have hope and to work through it and to not give up, you know, it takes it takes a lot. And um, there were moments I thought, I'm just, I'm just not going to make it. And I'm washed up. I'll never play music again. You know, I lost my wife. Mm. Um, I lost so much. And I, uh, you know, um, didn't think there was a moment there. I didn't think I was going to make it. Long story short, obviously, I soldiered through it. And after a lot of <laughs> a lot of, like I said, surgeries and medical um, treatments. Uh, I finally got myself back to, you know, a, a place of health, uh, which was a miracle in itself. And I started to, when I started to play the piano again, I started to write just from my gut. And that eventually became the, uh, the genesis of the album, of this debut album of mine. Um, at least 75% of the pieces on there were written um, during this period. And a lot of them were completely improvised and realized in like one take. No way. Yeah. Um, and I, and it, it was like all this emotion of everything I'd been through just pouring through me. And um so this is this is an amazing time for me because not only am I finally releasing my own music, but it's like kind of like a phoenix rising from the ashes, you know, from thinking I was through, that I was washed up, and thinking I might not even survive, to um, you know becoming healthy again and playing music again, and finally releasing this. It's been like a nine year journey to get here um, to this point. Um, and each piece tells like a little story, um, you know, behind it. There's a little bit, it's a, it's a very personal release. Um, and um, I, I, I just feel blessed to be alive and be here talking with you, you know. And to finally getting this music out, you know. Um, so yeah, I relate to like what you were saying. Um, 
of wanting to bring people together and bring a little hope and bring a little, uh, you know, because let's face it, you know, this, these are kind of strange times we're in right now. Yeah. I've, I've never seen the, the negativity and the, the, the absolute division that I'm seeing now. And I, oh. I, I don't want to get into politics at right. all because I mean, number one, most people probably don't like my politics. And number two, that's not the point of the show. Yeah. Um, but I, I feel like we should try to bring some positivity and inspiration to others. Whatever yeah. happened to, to, to serving other people instead of just serving yourself. Amen. Well, you're just, you're speaking my language. <laughs> I tell you, are you my brother? <laughs> I mean, hey. That's how I feel. You know, uh, that's this music. I'm hoping that's what I want. I want to uplift people. I want to move people. I want to touch people. I want them to feel that um, there is beauty in this world still. Yeah. Um, there is reasons to go on and we can come together. And, we, you know, to me, the whole purpose of art is to move people. And, and uh, if I can, in my little small way, bring any light into anyone's life right now, wow it's all worth it to me. Yeah. You know, I mean, the, you know, when I started selling this album on Bandcamp, I've been getting lots of feedback from people and people are writing me really lengthy, heartfelt messages about how the music made them feel. Um, you know, one woman said that it brought back a memory for her when she first, her husband first proposed to her 30 years ago in Italy. I mean, she shared that story with me from hearing, she said, hearing your music made me think of my first kiss. Wow. And you just go, oh, I, how do you even, I mean, that's priceless, you know, to hear something like that. It's so, I'm so blessed and honored to know that that's happening because that's what I live for. You know, I live for, for trying to help and uplift others. Um, and so that's, boy, when you hear stuff like that from folks, it means everything, you know? Yeah. Even more than does. somebody thinking you're a great pianist or a great artist, you know? I mean, that's <laughs> nice to hear, uh, but it's, it's, it's very gratifying when people are touched. So I'm with you, man. <laughs> we, we got to bring some light into this world because it's, like you said, we don't want to necessarily go there, but it's falling apart people are at each other's throats and yep. it's it's uh you know not a good not a good thing you know <laughs> yeah it's well everybody seems to be self-serving now and don't get me wrong i mean yeah you should have some self-esteem you should work on yourself you should know who you are and and be true to who you are but you get more satisfaction in being service of other people. At least I, to me. That's I couldn't agree with you more. Um, you know, I trained as a therapist um, along with my musical training. Um, and because I wanted to help others in pain, you know, I went through in my own family, uh, you know, um, uh, there was mental illness in my family. My mother was... Um, even before I was born, had her first nervous breakdown. Wow. And uh, my mother suffered from uh, schizophrenia and depression all her life. And so growing up in that was, if you can imagine, it was quite difficult. But I remember thinking, even as a young boy, I want to help my mom. I want to help others, you know. And uh, so I trained um, also along with music. I trained as a therapist. Um, and because uh, once again, it's about serving others. That's where, for me, that's where the joy and the meaning comes from. Um, if I can help anyone, then I will, you know. And for me, being a therapist or being a musician, in many ways, is very similar, oh, you know. Yeah. Um, 
you know, you're, 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 you're wanting, you want to touch people, you want to move them, you want to lift them. Um, you know, God, music is so cathartic, you know, uh, a song can save somebody's life, you know, <laughs> you know? it literally can. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, so, you know, or I'm with you. I'm with you. I'm exactly. I couldn't agree with you more, Kyle. It's Kyle, right? I'm sorry. Oh yeah. Yeah. I just wanted. To, yeah. I couldn't agree with you more about what you were saying. Well, you know, when the music of the '50s and the '60s, it, when it hit the scene, it was more a lot about breaking barriers and bringing people together. You know, how how many stories did you hear of when they'd have a, a, a auditorium divided by a, a rope and you had like uh, whites on one side, blacks on the other. And the next thing you know, they're taking that down. And everybody's dancing together and enjoying the music. And right. you know, I, that that is healing it. When you have something in common with people, it, it brings you together and and. It, now it seems like people are looking for reasons to divide each other. Yes. It's like everybody's circling their own little tribe wagons. Exactly. And it's, it's, and it's all this crazy black and white thinking, you know, mm -hmm. I'm right. You're wrong. I'm this, you're that, you know, um, and we objectify people and dehumanize them. And, and uh, it's, it's very, it's sad. It, it breaks my heart to see this going on because I remember that time I was, I wasn't old enough to participate in like the sixties counterculture thing, but I was old enough to see what was going on. I was just like a little kid, but um, people were really trying, however naive or whatever excesses there were in the sixties. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and you had these incredible artists like Morrison, Jim Morrison and Hendrix and, self-destruct and Janis Joplin, these beautiful artists, these transcended artists, you know, self-destructed, unfortunately. But there was a genuine desire, like you said, to do this, to break through all this and to bring people together. And it reflected in people's art, musicians and artists and writers. This was their motivation. Yeah. We seems, it seems like we've lost a lot of that now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's yeah. just too much of me, me, me. It's my wants, my needs, and the heck with everybody else and how you feel. I'm sorry, that's just not how the, the world no. goes around. And that's, the and that's you know, and you tell me if this is an okay direction to go into, but that's sort of the foundation of my spirituality. You know, yeah. I don't look to self for, um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? For a sense of worthiness or or um, uh, importance you know mm -hmm. i look outside of myself call it what you want god i look to the creator for that guidance for that love for that inspiration and i want that to come through me to others i want others to feel that through him yeah. um and when you have that relationship with the, the whatever you want people call it different things higher power god great spirit you know higher consciousness whatever when you look outside of yourself to that um there is no worship of self exactly you know um, because that's what we're seeing in in in, in our society a, a, a worship of self mm-hmm and and um and now we and we are seeing what that sows we are we are seeing the consequences of that kind of selfishness mm -hmm. um and um yeah so for me spiritually like you were saying earlier like a lot of people may not agree with your politics like like my spirituality and my politics actually, but my spirituality, <laughs> but my spirituality also um, is contrary to the prevailing social construct right now, you know? Yeah. Um, Cause I'm saying, Hey, it's not me. Um, um, 
I'm not going to look within myself and find, you know, <laughs> this divine being. It's all in me, you know. No, I look outside of myself to my creator, you know, and I'm his mm -hmm. humble, I'm his vessel. I'm his humble servant. I try to be anyway, you know. Yeah. Um, um, and when you have that perspective, um, you're able to look at everyone in a different way. We're all, we're all the same. We're all here. Um, and uh, um, so that, that keeps me centered and it keeps me sane and healthy, you know? Yeah. And it's really how I got through the nine years I described earlier of, of the, the, you know, the hell of, you know, my health deteriorating. It was holding on to that relationship, you know, with God that, that um, saved me really through it all. You know, I'm going to blow your mind, but about 20 some odd years ago, I was a preacher. <laughs> oh, wow. Wow. <laughs> and uh, I strayed. I got away from God. Uh, thank, thank the maker that uh, he never left me. Right. But it, it took um, a lot of different circumstances. I mean, a heart attack at 36 years old, uh, my, my wife leaving me for another man and you know, nearly losing my children and all these things to the alcohol, the drugs, the, you know, running around and all these things was just, it was destroying me. Yeah. And I, I have a new, a uh, new wife and she encouraged me to get back on my spiritual path. And, you know, I'm getting that relationship back with God. Yeah. Am I perfect? By no means. By no means. I I still do things I shouldn't do. And but you know, those convictions, they when they come, I work on them. Yeah. And I, I'm I'm doing it in his time instead of my time. Exactly. I think you and I, we are speaking the same language. You know, <laughs> we are speaking, you know, uh because you know. <laughs> we don't want to. <laughs> I understand exactly where you're coming from, and I think it's beautiful. I mean, you know, God, God can restore any broken thing, mm -hmm. and um, you know, I see myself. You know, I'm like this broken jar of clay. To, you know, to quote a phrase. You know, and whatever strength and whatever abilities. I have is he and is it is he who is in me, you know, and that keeps you centered and it keeps you, um, you know, your eye on the right things and um, and thank God you've come like full circle, and and I mean what a beautiful story you know, you you got you got to like start your life over again you know after losing everything, mm -hmm. right? That's for sure. You know, and now I have three absolutely handsome, wonderful grandchildren. That, wow. uh, those boys are, they're everything to, to Papa. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Wow. Yeah. See, this, this always, this inspires me when I hear stories like this, you know, this, this is what makes, makes me uh, realize there's still hope, right? There's still hope even within the darkness that that is uh, seems to be, you know, overwhelming these days. I hear something like this from you and uh, what a beautiful, what a beautiful thing, you know, it, it, it gives you hope, right? It does. You know, I, I've, I've been pleasantly surprised how many guests have come on and, and have spoken about their spirituality and their relationship with God and, some young people that have come on here that's that gives me hope you know when i hear a 20 something year old telling me yeah i'm 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 walking with god and i'm like oh thank you thank you there is there yeah. is hope there is hope for the future yeah because yeah. you know it, it's tricky in this business you know in the entertainment business music uh, film mm -hmm. uh, a lot of times you meet a lot of let me just say it this way. Um, you meet a certain percentage of folks that are hostile to what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and I've had many musicians on my social media, you know, I have a 
a large Facebook music fan page following. And, and a lot of musicians come out from out of the closet and private message me, you know, and they say, man, thanks for talking about God the way you do. Thanks for standing up and being bold. I go, don't you get afraid of the, that you're going to be blackballed and not get work? And, you know, I know that's happened. I know there are musicians that told me that they didn't want to work with me because of my, my faith, you know, yeah. um, and that's okay. You know, that's okay. Um, you know, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna be something I'm not so I can make extra money, you know, or, or you know. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. But it, it, it is, it is interesting how many, um, and some well-known musicians, by the way, and I, and I will respect their anonymity, yeah. have surprised me and contacted me, you know, people that I look up to and have said to me privately, you know, wow, thanks for, thanks for being bold and just, <laughs> and, you know, and speaking out, you know, about it and not being afraid. And, uh, and it's like, wow. You know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I uh, made friends with a, a bass player from a very well known heavy metal band that uh, he told me he was Christian and you know, he told me he prays every day and wow. he does, he doesn't drink, he doesn't do the drugs and all that. And he raises his, he very very much of a, a a family man so you know he raised his kids you know to to go to church and to pray and wow it would blow your mind but you know once again you you leave it for them to to talk about that right because you know some for career reasons there are folks that are afraid you mm -hmm. know of actors writers musicians because there is an open hostility to christians uh, it's getting worse and um, yep. and yeah. uh, and the irony is, we are the least threatening people you could ever meet. Yeah, but if you listen to mainstream media, it sounds like we're this extreme radical group that's out to kill people and to, yeah. to end people. I'm like the um, I don't know what group you're talking about, but not the people that yeah. I know. Because the you know the Christ that I follow. You know that role model he loved everyone mm -hmm. i mean he protected i mean the religious and political people of his time you know uh oh, they he rebuked him. yeah you know and you're hanging out with prostitutes and drunkards and you know gluttons and you know and we're holy and you know look at you what you know and you know he you know his heart uh was for the lost and for the weak and for the you know struggling folks so anybody who is a, is an actual christian um and who really follows christ in that way you know we're the le we're the we're the most empathetic people you could meet you know we're the most loving and forgiving and understanding um and and you're right we're portrayed you know we're portrayed these days, especially, you know, in the culture and in media, you know, as like you said, we're the some the, the extremists. Um, mm -hmm. And um, because any 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 Christian knows in his heart of hearts that um, we can't we can't judge anyone. Oh, no. And we're no better than anyone else. And um, we're all, we all fall short. Like you said, we all make mistakes. That's right. You know, we all fall short of the glory of God. That's right. And thank God he's there to pick us up and dust us off. And, you know, yeah. um, it's now that we're actually, you know, that we're talking, it, he is the reason I'm here alive, healthy, and sane talking to you. <laughs> You know, yeah. <laughs> I had no idea we would even go. In this <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad we did. Me too. I mean, this is uh, what do they call that? A divine appointment, right? That's, you know, that's right. You know, you know, and you know, it don't don't get it wrong. I mean, yes, Jesus hung around with the the people who were the sinners, but he also 
let them know what they were doing was wrong. That's right. But but he didn't come out here and say, oh, well, just because you're a prostitute, well, you're not going to get saved and you get out of my presence. No, it's like, you know. Uh, Remember the woman that uh, they wanted to stone? And he said, woman, who's here to accuse you? Mm -hmm. He goes, no one, no one is here. I don't accuse you. But he did say, go and sin no more. Exactly. You know, so. Yeah, we were taught to love the sinner, but hate the sin. Right. But I can't condemn you. I, You know, I, I heard someone talking about a, a person on the news the other day. Well, that person's going to hell. Well, I don't know that. That's right. You know, um, and who am I to say that I don't deserve it? Because, you know, all liars will have their part in the lake that burneth with fire and brimstone. And how many times have I lied in my life? You exactly. Know? Um, how many times have I taken something that didn't belong to me? Um, Bible says if you just to look upon a woman and to lust after her is the same as committing adultery. adultery so, right. So, how many times have I done that? I do it every day. <laughs> well, not. But I'm, <laughs> I, I try know, not I, to. But, uh, <laughs> I don't. Do, the nice, the, the wonderful thing about having the relationship with Christ is we can catch ourselves, mm -hmm. you know, we get convicted by the Holy Spirit. And the more, the closer our walk with God and the more in tune with the Holy Spirit, we naturally stop doing those things. We stop going to those places. Mm -hmm. And if we do, we can catch it, you know, yeah. and, and, and not go there. Because the temptations are all over every day. Oh my God, especially being a musician. <laughs> oh, I can only imagine. I mean, you go out and play and you have people throwing themselves at you. You know, mm -hmm. um, it, it's 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 a circus, you know. And that's one thing my wife appreciated, you know, my ex-wife. She said, I never met a man who who she says, You never you never indulged, or these women would come on to me right in front of her, in front of my own wife. You know, and she said, you just put out, you know, a very strong vibe, like you're not interested. She said you were polite, but she goes, I've never, she goes, I believe me, I would watch you. And I, she goes, I'd never see you, you know, checking women out or, or even when they're checking you out, you know. And I said, that's Christ in me, you know, left to myself. I'd be the biggest drunken whore on the planet. <laughs> <laughs> you know? I'd make Jim Morrison look like Mr. Rogers. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> and see, because we had a conversation, we found out what we had in common. Yeah, this is amazing. That's what wow. more people need to do. Yeah. I'm hoping this is, a, what was that great line from Casablanca? You know, I hope this is the beginning of a great friendship, you know. <laughs> that would be awesome, man. Yeah. <laughs> you know, my my circle has changed so much over the years. Uh, I, I have people that are in my life that I, I love dearly and I would do anything for, um, but I can't hang out with them because they... You know, even when we were in high school, yeah, I partied and all that stuff, mm -hmm. and I would do anything for them. And you know, we stayed friends through the years. And I would, as I would have done anything for them then, I would do for them now. But they still want to do the same things that we did in high school, and I can't do that. You know, right, I, right. I'm a grandpa. I want to be that role model for my grandchildren and right. you know lord knows that i robbed my children of a, a great childhood because i was a drunken father that just cared about himself and i don't want to rob them of the father they have now and go back to that stuff yeah. so the people that i hang out now around now are people that are goal-minded you know they they're successful or they're on a path to success that they, uh, you know, they, they walk the straight and narrow. Let's put it that way. Um, yeah. And, and it's important who we surround ourselves with. Yeah. I mean, I had to part, I had to part way with, 
with some very close friends along the way. Um, you know, and it wasn't, it really wasn't what I wanted. Um, but some folks, um, you know, they're just, you know, the name Jesus Christ is a very uh, iconoclastic thing. You bring up Christ and, uh, you know, it's a very powerful name. Mm -hmm. And there are people that are so afraid of it and so hostile towards it, um, you know. Uh, and so I've had to I've had to let go of some very close friends over the years uh, because of this. I didn't want it to be that way, but um, you know they made choices, mm -hmm. and you know you have to just wipe the dust off your feet and and keep moving. You know, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's very you know it's very important that the, the the inner circle of people that we have in our lives, you know, reflect you know, reflect our walk and uh, we need to encourage each other and support each other and, and lift each other up and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, not stumble each other, you know. Um, yeah. So, yeah. 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 Uh, anybody that you, you come between that relationship with Christ, um, <laughs> it's not yeah. going to be good for you. <laughs> no, that's a very, people don't realize that's a very playing with spiritual fire there. Yeah. Um, it says, what, what does the Bible say that if you, um, if you get between uh, a child and, and that relationship with Christ, that you might as well have a millstone tied around your neck? neck. Yes, absolutely. It would be better if that man wasn't born. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and boy, we're seeing a lot of that today. What's happening to children? That's a whole other story, right? But uh, yeah, unfortunately, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's um, yeah, good lord. <laughs> but yeah, um, we got to do our best. We have to be an example and not, you know, I'm I don't I don't listen to that garbage that the news has to say. They they want to demonize us, but. Yeah, if people see how I act and how I react, then they'll say, "Okay, so that's what Christ in your life is supposed to be like." Yeah. Right? They'll see the fruits of of, of who you are. They'll, you know, that mm -hmm. old great hymn. You know, they they'll know we are Christians by our love. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, what's the great scripture? The line, you know, if I I can be, I'm going to butcher this. You know, I could have wisdom. I could, uh, I could, uh, you know, pontificate. The, you know, the greatest uh, theological knowledge. I could, you know, but if I don't have love, I'm I'm just noise, like tinkering cymbals. Or I'm butchering that whole. Um, uh, hey, I'm I'm just as bad, so don't don't yeah. feel bad about it. <laughs> but the idea is, you know, we could have. We, you and I could be like uh, a Pharisee. We could know the scriptures. We could memorize them. We could, uh, you know, be incredible apologetics, you know, and, 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 and pontificate for hours about, you know, theology and eschatology and scripture and church history. And, and, but if we don't have love, we're nothing. That's right. You know, and if we don't have his love, then it's nothing. Yeah, so that's right. Yeah. Well, and God, God hasn't changed. Uh, it's, it's, we, who we're the ones that have changed. Society's yeah. the one that's changed. I, it's sad to say some churches have changed. Oh yeah. The, the American church is, I think in crisis, there's been a, it's being co-opted. It's allowing itself to be compromised by the world, mm -hmm. you know, uh, for really um, sort of selfish, banal reasons, you know, it's, uh, a lot of it has to do with money. Right. They want more congregation. They want more people in the pews. They want to raise more money. Um, and so they water down the gospel to where you don't even recognize it anymore. Yep. And then you have young people that aren't getting fed spiritually. They don't That's even right. know what a Christian is anymore. Nope. And so, well, the you know, these times were spoken of by Christ, you know, when the, when the disciples asked him, you know, what would the end times be like? What will happen? 
you know, uh, it's called the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24. And he, he gives a whole outline of what the world's going to look like. And I look around and I'm going, check, check, <laughs> yeah. check. Right. You know, and people say, well, hasn't it always been this way? Not like this. Yes, there's yeah. always been these things, but not to the extent, to the degree, and all at once, all converging into yep. this into this dark soup. Yes, there's always been famine and pestilences and wars and rumors of wars and sexual depravity and you know whatever, um, but not like what we're seeing now. Yeah, we are it's... we are seeing things go on now that two years ago we would laugh at someone if they said something like the, the, the world could be what it's like now mm -hmm. people would laugh at you you're, you know oh yeah there's a great line i don't know if you're into um uh you know the uh kevin gilbert the artist kevin gilbert kevin gilbert the name's familiar he was in uh toy matinee um and um uh, he 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 died very young, tragically, also, like in his late 20s, I think, or early 30s. But he was kind of like an art rock, progressive rock musician. A lot of uh, Prague fans love him. Um, I think um, one of the guys in Spock's Beard, the drummer, worked with with Kevin. Okay. Um, and uh, uh, But he had a song called Goodness Gracious. And there's a line he says, what horrors will be commonplace when my hairs turn gray? You know, um, kind of uh, talking about this very thing. But yeah, I would, I would. By the way, just in passing, I would highly recommend uh, Kevin Gilbert. Um, he had a few albums out. One called Thud, and the one he made before he passed was called The Shaming of the True. <laughs> which was a takeoff on the taming of the taming of the shrew. Of the shrew. <laughs> yeah. yeah. He was supposed to play, he was going to be rail in the Lamb Lies Down on Broadway to replace um Peter Gabriel. No way. Yeah. Oh wow. So um if you ever get a chance, check him out. Uh, I would highly recommend it's great music. Um and he had like I think one of his hits was Last Plane Out. I think it even had rotation in MTV, a song called Last Plane Out. I bet I know it. I, I'm sure you know it, yeah. I, I would definitely recommend it. Uh, I know a lot of great musicians love his work, you know. Um, so just just mention in passing there. <laughs> Kevin hey. Gilbert. I'm I'm definitely going to look that up. Man, we, yeah. we, have, uh, we have gone through our time. But, wow. Uh, Okay, one more time. The name of the album. The album is called Kindred Souls. Mm -hmm. And um, it's all my solo piano work. And um, uh, like I said earlier, it's nine years in the making. And it basically, it's it, you can hear me. I'm just pouring my heart and soul out into this music. It's the most personal music I could release. You know, it's very personal and, uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm so, I'm so blessed that I've been able to do this finally, you know, because I've, like I said, I've, I've been a studio musician all these years. I've played on a lot of other people's albums that you never get credit for. Right. You know, you know, I did, right. work with, I did work with Steve and, and co-wrote the thing with Steve. Um, I also, back in 2010, um, was able to co-write a piece with uh, Spock's Beard, the prog group Spock's Beard, with uh, Alan uh, Morse, uh, the guitarist, and his brother Neil. And as you may know, Neil's like uh, left Spock's Beard and became sort of a Christian prog artist. And uh, but Alan called me over, and uh, I was able to play a whole do a whole piano jazz fusion section in a song called The Emperor's Clothes. Uh, I was very, very happy about that, um, just really quick, because I had met Alan um, back in the early 90s at a party at 
a guy named Christian Nesmith, Mike Nesmith from the Monkey's son. Oh, no uh, way. Yeah. <laughs> It was right here in like Studio City, Sherman Oaks, right? And I was playing the keyboard in the studio and Alan walks in and he goes, who are you? That's great. And we started jamming together and he gave me this tape called The One. And it was a demo of him and his brother, Neil. I still have the demo. It's probably worth a lot, the, the, the tape. Uh, they were, they were, it was the beginnings of what became Spock's Beard, the band Spock's Beard. Wow. And I was going to possibly be in the band, but it didn't work out. And so it was nice to come full circle all the years later to do a little guest writing and playing with, with Spock's beard, you know? Wow. So, so, so that, that was another thing that was really fun, but I have had a lot of little, you know, I won't go into it cause I know we got to go, but I've had over the years, a lot of fun little experiences like that. So sort of behind the scene, and it just, you know, in conclusion, I just want to say it just what a blessing to finally <laughs> release my own music because I I have enough material already for like seven CDs. Wow. You know, in, in, in my catalog, you know, if I never wrote another piece of music for the next two years, I have all this music. I've always written music and composed music. So so um, and you, by the way, my friend, are my first interview. Well, thank you and so what a blessing uh i can't tell you how much i've enjoyed your company kyle well thank you i, <laughs> I really appreciate that yeah well i will say I, I listened to the whole album and it's it's relaxing it's um it's classical music without feeling like you're listening in the elevator let's put it that way right um there was some of it that I could say it kind of reminded me a little bit of Bruce Hornsby. Oh yeah, Bruce. I I love Bruce's playing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. he's a great player. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah the, I could definitely, yeah. The def that definitely you know other other keyboard players. I say the other two keyboard players that influenced me the most were were Chick Korea in the jazz realm, guys mm -hmm. like Chick, and then Keith Emerson from Emerson Lake and Palmer. Oh yeah, you know uh, his influence isn't reflected in um, in maybe the song um, called um, "Renewal." Uh, probably reflects a, a little bit more of that Prague Keith Emerson influence in there, and then the song "Barcelona" is definitely a Chick Corea influenced piece. It's you know it's yeah. it's got that Latin jazz thing to it, um, um, but yeah, those those two were were major influences on me as a pianist. Yeah. And of course, you mentioned classical. Yeah, I love classical music. And so there's definitely going to be classical influences in my composition. And it's a, it's a reflective, understated, personal album. You know, mm -hmm. the next one's, the next one, I'm going to just kick it all out, you know, uh, and it'll reflect more of the influences we talked about. But um, um, I, I'm just... Uh, happy to um to finally release this sort of personal piano music you know to start to sort of start my little solo career if you will <laughs> well it, it's it's an awesome album I, so I can definitely hear the jazz influence in it um it's it's not going it's relaxing but it's not going to put you to sleep how about that is that, is that a yeah. good description yeah, I yeah, that boy, the last thing I would want to do is uh you know, you know, no, I no, I appreciate that. And it's funny because real quick, I've had other artists that have listened to it and they go, you know, there's a lot, there are a lot of pianists that put out these sort of that call them new age kind of Yeah, I know exactly what you mean. But they're they do kind of put you to sleep, some of them, you know. Well, they're meant to. <laughs> right. <laughs> Uh, and they've said, you know, what I like about yours is it, it's it's not you go. He goes, you go much deeper than that. Mm -hmm. Somewhere in between the classical and the jazz and the new age, and, and uh, you know, so uh, I'm very grateful to hear that it didn't make you feel like it was going <laughs> to put you to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> I never thought I'd be recommending a, a piano album, but this is, a, I would definitely recommend this. And uh, oh, and your website. Oh, um, well, 
Uh, first, I'll share the the Bandcamp because that's where you can literally buy it uh, direct. Mm -hmm. That's Larry Kutcher, L A R R Y K U T C H E R, Larry Kutcher dot Bandcamp dot com. And uh, I do have a personal website, but it's not. It's in the process of being. I finally hired like a professional. Okay webmaster to do something with it because i tried to make one myself and it's just not professional it's just it's kind of boring <laughs> yeah so, mine is too so don't feel bad <laughs> so, you know i do have a it's it's larrycutcher.com mm -hmm. um and it's up now and it, it has some of the music up there but it's going to go through some 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 drastic changes um and then i also have i have a a, a pretty i have over fourteen thousand followers on my facebook fan page and that's like you know facebook.com slash uh larry cutcher music so it's my name and then music so you can find a lot of my work there as well um you know so those are the main i have a youtube channel as well but it's youtube larry cutcher you know so. well i'll make it easy on folks I, I usually put the links in the description so they can just click on it and go straight to it but yeah uh, you're, you're, you're on Facebook, and is there any other social media sites you're on? Yeah, I'm on Facebook. I'm on Instagram. I'm on Twitter um, and YouTube and uh, Bandcamp. So those are the those are the main ones. Um, and then uh, starting tonight at 12.01, I'll be a featured uh, verified artist on Spotify, Apple Music, iTunes, uh, Pandora, um also my youtube channel will will be converted to an, a verified artist channel so wow i become a professional <laughs> tonight <laughs> <laughs> well that just means i'm not going to be able to share the music ah ah <laughs> please do i <laughs> uh, see I, I sometimes i like to to put a little bit of the music like at the beginning and the end of the video and and sometimes YouTube will give me a, that that uh, copyright strike, and I'm not able to use it. Or uh, you'll get all the money; I'll get nothing. So yeah, if you go to like the Larry <laughs> Cutcher Bandcamp one, uh -huh. you know, it's streaming there right now, all, the whole album. So uh, um, well, uh, we'll see. I'll put it in there. We'll see what happens. Yeah, see what happens. Yeah, okay. But yeah, man, man, I can't tell you how much I've enjoyed this. This is been a great conversation this really has i i didn't you know you never know what anything's going to be like and i've enjoyed this more than i ever even imagined i would and and because you made it you made it that way for me and uh, i i'm Thank really you. pleased to meet you kyle same here we're gonna have to stay in touch brother i would love to seriously and i know a lot of people say that and blow smoke and you know but i i really mean it i would love to kyle absolutely all right well Hang on, and as soon as this is over, I'll uh, I'll give you my info. Fantastic, wonderful. And I, I want to thank all of you out there too. If you are new to the channel, I hope you'll come back. Uh, please hit that subscribe button for my regulars out there. You guys are wonderful because you make it possible for me to do this. So until the next one, everyone, please take care. Be kind to one another. God bless and peace. Amen.